Welcome back to Arena the Contest here with the uh, flanks and code as usual. And uh, today we're going to do the last class spotlight. And uh, today is a very special uh, spotlight considering this is the special class. So uh, the special class is unique in the way that uh, they don't, they're not really a class in the way that uh, the other classes exist. So the other classes, they all share the same stats and they all share the same passives and they all exist in the same type of theme and mentality of all the characters. So they all share the same idea, right? Like all healers are gonna focus on healing, but they're gonna do it in different ways. Specials are uh, completely different. They're all unique in their own way, and that is exactly why they're special. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, from first wave, uh, or at least from the original arena of the contest, there's actually only two uh, special characters: the Faceless Emperor and uh, Hur Huron. Uh, how do you think you pronounce it? Hur Huron? Oh, uh, Huron, Huron, I think. Huron? Haran, the shapeshifter. So there's only two uh, heroes that normally come with that. But uh, considering that Talessa, the Dragon Queen, is going to be coming out to people's shelves here in uh, hopefully a couple months or so with the Dragon Collection. And most people that are watching this series now have probably ordered everything from... Uh, or might have ordered a lot of the items from the uh, Kickstarter 2 content and getting the dragon collection we're throwing talessa in there because since she's coming out at the same time I, I basically now consider her part of uh uh the first arena uh revision uh and then uh when Teneris adventures come out then we'll be basically in generation two of where we have uh, all the new heroes and kind of we'll, we'll see them out so i mean she's kind of a 1.5 for sure but uh, still, still very much within the the first generation, I'd say. All right, so let's uh, jump right into it. So uh, it'll be a little different today. So we'll start with Huron the shapeshifter. Huron the shapeshifter. He doesn't have any initial stats, and that is because his very first uh, his passive is when you re recruit him, you get to choose your combat role. So. You, that what that basically means is you get to choose whether Huron is a brute, tactician, bruiser, tank, healer, shooter, or controller. And depending on which one you choose, he will get the stats of that class and he will retain um, the uh, passive ability of that class as well. So you'll notice that there's this little reference ca card here that uh, basically you'll use as your uh, reference for, um, for Huron. So you can, uh, in, in terms of like physically using this, you could just use the, the card there to potentially remember. Um, I think when, um, sometimes when I'm playing, like I'm, I may actually bring like another character sheet just to like reference, like if I was picking a brute, I may take one of the brute cards and, and use that to kind of look at as well. And, you know, in case I'm not gonna, like, I want to maybe like overlay it sort of like behind it or something. So I could see this, the stats. Um, so like maybe, I don't know if I could even do that exactly here. But basically, like this, this is what I personally have done in the past when I'm playing this character, and I just kind of ignore the, you know, Count Blake or whatever on the left. But this way, it's like a reminder to myself that, okay, I've chosen Brute, and uh, these are his stats, and then, you know, I can use a reference card for uh, his passive, or I can look at the other one, you know, below. But you know, I'm. I played this quite, game quite a bit, so I, I do remember those relatively pretty easily. But anyway, the reference card, definitely easy, easy, good enough to do as well. All right, so let's jump into his abilities. So uh, Huron's got uh, kind of a variety of different things. Uh, one of his best ones here is uh, 500 faces. It's a ranged attack, which is kind of different. Um, and so he'll get a benefit of bonus two to his roll, which is really good. Zero damage effect, 
and this will be a copy of a primary attack from the, a target and then you may move yourself up to two squares and make that primary attack. So this is kind of similar to Puppet Dance. In fact, uh, now that I think about it, this is identical. Uh, you may move the target up to two squares and then control by you, it makes it. So yeah, it's it's like it's almost like the rev a little bit of a reversed effect, right? So like Puppet Dance, you're controlling somebody else and you're removing them two spaces and then making uh, their primary attack with Huron you're um, you're going to you know do the roll and then you copy that primary attack for from whoever you pick you get it you get to choose which one that you're gonna do and then uh, make those two two movement and then do it yourself so it's it's very similar except kind of the the other side so it's the enemy you're doing it so pretty straightforward getting primary uh, ability this is definitely what uh, Huron really uh, focuses in on is being able to kind of you know do, do anything that's needed he's very versatile character in the way that he can kind of just copy and uh, use different abilities and, and uh, conditions as he sees fit um, so uh, and you know I guess one thing I forgot to quickly mention is of course the special class isn't actually included in the compendium so there's not really like a stats thing that we can look at with him um, but generally I'd say he's not really a super high damage character although it can kind of depend on which combat stats you pick right I mean a lot of those um, those numbers that we did in all the previous class spotlights uh, all were dependent on like w you know which class right and then their abilities played a part in that as well and uh, so it's a little different with him but uh, generally he's, he's probably about medium level uh, damage and uh, we'll, we'll get further on and see what that is so then his second ability is change state uh, change shape range one one enemy 11 damage you choose a combatant within five squares you apply any condition on it this condition ends if it's used except hastened or slowed so that's actually uh, extremely strong and you'll see later here when we get to the Dragon Queen it's actually really close uh, in some ways to like her ability too so just being able to pick um, any condition on an enemy uh, you know it's really good right you can throw down cursed on somebody make somebody exposed like a tank or somebody increase your chance of uh, hitting on him but obviously this would be for the next one because this is an effect so you get to do it on the next the next turn um, but overall uh, pretty good uh, ability there I mean it's not anything mind-changing but he is a character that because he has that versatility he's good for setting up uh, other team members uh, for for making his attacks uh, or making their attacks and to to, you know increase uh, team damage basically with it so all right moving on to clone his first special attack uh, range one one enemy zero damage regain 18 hit points and then the permanent is gain a copy of one special attack from the target that's either spent unspent or removed so that's also there, there is a lot of similarities between Alorain and uh, Huron, uh, except, um, so like I'm thinking Cerebrokinosis, where she's doing a ranged attack, uh, and then she get, but she gets to like move the target and then gets to uh, make one of the special attacks as that character against their own team, except uh, similar to like 500 faces instead of uh, doing it to that enemy now he is taking that that on um, and obviously you get a really good benefit of it being spent unspent or removed uh, because you know like for instance with cerebral chronosis in our example is it has to be one that's actually available so if an ability has already been used obviously you're not going to be able to use that so that uh, does limit your choices and your targets versus clone you basically have unlimited reign on what you can do with that so uh, it's a great um, 
great ability to have, uh, at least that, that aspect of it. One thing to keep in mind too, um, is you'll notice that it says you get to gain a copy of a spell, but it doesn't say you get to play it, which means you'll get that heal, which is really the the bigger part that Cerebro Kenosis didn't have, right? You don't you don't get any other effect other than um, you know than making that attack. So in this case, you're getting a heal, then you're getting a copy of a special attack, and um, and then uh, the next turn you'll be able to use that. And one thing to keep in mind as well is it's, I guess the wording can be a little confusing and maybe, I don't know if his card actually does provide much clarification on this or not. Uh, where is it? There it is. Yeah. Okay. It does. Okay. Gain a copy of one special attack from the target. You spend, blah, blah. lose that attack when you use it. Temporary effects end at the start of Huron's turn. Use this card to track the attacks effect. Okay, so uh, really, what I was I was kind of leading down towards is because it says permanent, it gives the idea of like, oh, well, I get to use that attack all the time. No, that's not the case. Case, it's exactly the same as every other special. You just get to choose whichever one, uh, whichever special attack that you want. You get to copy it, but you still only get to use it that one time. So that's uh, basically what his clone card is uh, saying, is that you're going to use that, and then you're going to use this card to track that card's uh, effect. So anyway, clone is a great ability in that versatility, but you do remember you have to set it up because you're not going to get a make an attack that turn. It's mostly just for healing yourself, get, get yourself ready for, uh, for later. Um, all right, then you got Monstrous Form. This is one of uh, basically his big damage ability. It's really not a very exciting ability. Um, you do get to attack two targets and 16 damage per hit. So obviously you're getting up to 32 damage. Um, more if you picked, you know, a damage class like a, a Brute or, or a Shooter or who knows, maybe even a controller or a tactician if you set yourself up. But at least with a um, shooter controller and brute, uh, you can uh, put yourself into a spot to immediately do some extra damage. <clears throat> anyway, so not really too much to say on Monstrous Form. Uh, in my opinion, it's not really that great of an attack. It's just, you know, 16 damage, two enemies. I mean... I feel like it should probably do a little bit more damage, but I think they kind of figured that because of his ability to copy so many abilities, you know, copy any special, copy primary attacks, that uh, they didn't want to make his specials too too strong to use. And um, so I think that's kind of why Monstrous Form is a little lackluster in that, that way. Um, one other thing I don't think I mentioned about specials is I don't believe there is actually any official rules that say you can only have one special. So normally in the game, right, if you pick a brute character to join your team, so like in my case I joined, said, you know, hey, I'm picking Count Blake, um, I could not pick, you know, any of the other brutes for another member of my team. Specials, there's not, I believe that there's not actually an official rule that says you can only choose um, one special, but uh, previously how we have played is essentially the same kind of rule as if you pick a special, you can't pick another special, um, but that's kind of just our own home homebrew type, type rule, uh, but uh, you know, with, with them all being so different, there's not really that same level of uh, potential issue that you get. Like, for instance, if you pick two heroes, uh, two healers, for example, you know, you're going to get a team that's extremely powerful with heals and can, can probably do some pretty crazy stuff that makes the game a little unbalanced if you have two healers. Um, but... That's not really the case with specials because each of them are different. They don't share that same type of ability. So 
it doesn't really hold up the same way. So it's kind of up to you to decide if you want to do that or not. So anyway, uh, anything else you want to say about the shapeshifter? Um, no, I mean, you pretty much touched on everything that I was thinking. But uh, it's interesting, though, that his monstrous form is kind of lackluster when everything else does Yeah. some cool stuff. I mean... It was almost like they, I don't know, they just... Or maybe maybe he was like a little bit in a rush or something in character, you know, like building this hero and and maybe they just couldn't really think of something really good. So they're just like, yeah, let's let him attack two guys, but let's not make it too strong. Right. So I, I haven't had much time with her on. I think I used them maybe once. But, you know, his other abilities are pretty good. Yeah. Clones a little bit could be a little bit of long of a wait, especially if you're playing PvP. Yep. But I do like both of his other primaries. I mean, um, really, so... 500 faces for sure is the best ability. Um, right. Because, and, and I almost, I mean, clone is really good too, but like, I still feel like 500 faces is way better because he gets a bonus to his roll and he has a range 8 uh, attack, which the other ones are only single range, except for you know monsters form. But um, so, and then he also gets to actually make that attack. Versus like chain shape, he's setting up a condition to be used next time, and then clone uh, is setting up an attack for next time. So, mm -hmm. um, anyway. You know, and that, that does kind of bring up another aspect I was just thinking about, too, because normally, right, when you use a special uh, and you get to gain a copy of that uh, that special that you actually haven't, you know, officially, like, spent it, right? You, you just use another card. I think there's the question of, well, if I flip my, do I have to fit, flip my special token? And, you know, one and second is if, if I did flip my special token, do I have to wait a whole, you know, basically, does it have to get back to Huron and, you know, the, the special token flip back first before he can use it or not? Um, I think previously we have personally just like allowed him to be able to use it because you had to give up. Like we, we, we played it in the way that you had to give up a special token just to use clone. And so then, when it gets back to his turn again, he can use it, and he doesn't have to like have the special to actually use the uh, the ability. Hmm. <clears throat> so, anyway, um, I don't I don't know if the official rules really say anything specifically for this card. So that one might just kind of be up to your your choice on that one. Anyway, um, like I said, 500 faces, that uh, bonus and the range makes that really good and being able to make an attack with basically, you know, almost, you know, any any primary you want is uh, is really good. And, and then everything else is, you know, decent. But, you know, he's, he's just going to require a lot more knowledge about the game to use this character effectively. I don't, per I personally haven't seen a game yet where, for one thing, he doesn't get played that often in the games that we've played. And second is, uh, even when I do see him played, I haven't seen him played effectively. So, keep that in mind. Maybe not a good uh, first pick there. All right, let's go to the Faceless Emperor. So the Faceless Emperor does actually have stats. He's got 60 hit points, 7 basic attacks, 7 defense, and 6 movement. So he is actually, basically, he, he, he's a tactician. That's stat wise, he's a tactician. Um, and then his passive is absorption. The trigger is there is an enemy within four squares of you when your turn starts. And the effect is you copy a passive power from an enemy within four squares until the start of your next turn. So the Faceless Emperor is kind of interesting in the way that his passive is going to change. Uh, depending on who's near him and who you choose to uh, to copy. So, um, you know, stat-wise, still say the same. It's just the passive effect, which can be potentially pretty powerful. Um, 
you know being able to especially depending on what enemy team you have and uh, I don't think it even has to be no it does say an enemy so you do have to be near an enemy so you want to make sure to def definitely get him into the battle um, you don't really want him to sit back otherwise he won't be able to trigger absorption um, but uh, Anyway, he, he can be played uh, very powerfully if used uh, appropriately, but it's going to take a lot of knowledge on, on where to who to pick and where to set up those those moves for it. Because basically, like if you wanted to do, let's say, like the brute passive brutality, um, <clears throat> you'd have to be near a brute within four squares. That's an enemy, and then you have to already be in position to hit that target. Um, that isn't adjacent to any of your allies. So you got to definitely do a lot of little, you know, prep thinking out, planning where you're going to go, what you're going to do. All right, let's jump to his uh, primary attacks. We got Imperial Salt. It is a two square C benefit and a one enemy. So the benefit here is actually pretty cool. You may forfeit your move ac action if you do. This attack has reach eight squares. So you can turn this uh, range two into an eight, which is awesome. Um, <clears throat> being able to... So w really what's... Uh, the, the, the crux of this is like, oh, well, why, why doesn't he just have an eight to begin with? Because he actually gets the, he gets the best of... Uh, what he chooses so normally if you're if you don't have anyone near you um, and you use you need that eight range then that will be the the way to take it but let's say you have somebody that's like one square away from you um, right you don't want to do a ranged attack you'd rather do uh, that uh, range two attack because you don't want to incite a, a, a reaction attack because, right, as we know before, if you are, um, if your character is here, right, and you're trying to make a ranged attack next to another character like this, uh, you're going to incite a reaction attack. So normally our shooters, right, they'd have to do a side step back and then they do their ranged attack. Well, the Emperor's kind of got that benefit that he can just choose to either you know if somebody's back here shoot them at range or he can just decide to do the uh the range two ability and not incite any reaction attacks so it's actually that benefits really good <clears throat> extremely good um and then the effect so 13 damage that's extremely strong primary right there 13 is uh on the top end of primary abilities and then the effect is you may negate effects that would move combatants within three square squares of you bamo that is uh, uh you know we've talked many many times about abilities that move characters as being really strong well one that like negates that uh especially for an area around you is uh probably just as strong if not stronger than that um, let's see, let's look at the card real quick, see if it gives us any other, uh, yeah, it doesn't really say anything else, but that's, that's really strong, especially 13 damage and being able to turn this, um, you know, it, this one's all about positioning without a doubt, right? I mean, with the benefit, the, uh, and then this effect positioning is definitely key with this character, but my God, that, that is a strong ability. All right, then we're going to move to Mystical Strike. It's a one square, one enemy. The benefit is before striking, you may declare a plus two bonus to your roll. If you do, the tiger takes three damage. Oh, what's the tiger, you say? Well, we're going to get to that here in a second. So uh, basically, well, I guess, I guess we could jump down to the tiger real fast, and then we'll come back to Mystical Strike. So... Summon Tiger, range 2 ability, 1 enemy, 16 damage, and the effect is a permanent summon Tiger, and it place, uh, place it within 5 squares of you. Uh, if you miss, apply the effect, but deal no residual damage. So you still get the Tiger regardless, and what the Tiger is, is a whole extra miniature. 
Um, with this extra stat sheet, so he's, the tiger itself has 25 hit points, basic 6, 6 defense, and 8 movement. The tiger also has his own rule set. So basically he moves uh, and attacks similar to uh, uh, heroes, but... Um, he doesn't actually like have any other attack than a basic attack, so he's only going to be doing uh, basic attacks, but he gets to move up to eight. Uh, there can only be, ever be one tiger, so unlike, like for instance, last week we talked about Celestial Armor, um, and if, uh, if you regained Celestial Armor, you could place that on someone else. Well, essentially you can't do that with the tiger. You don't get two, t two tigers to place. <clears throat> the tiger is immune to fe effects from allies, except those that specifically mention it, which basically means his abilities. Um, are, he, the the tiger is benefited by, but not uh, not by like you know the healers or tacticians or anybody else. Um, it can equip artifacts or perform any action requires flipping the team token. So no uh, specials can't do first aid. A um, bun bunch of extra things that uh, could be done normally. The tiger does not count as a hero for mob and focus. It cannot make primary special or reaction attacks. So, uh, like I said earlier, it only makes basic attacks and it can't make reaction attacks. So basically enemies ignore it, which actually you'll see here in a second is actually good because the foes can only target the tiger if there is no other possible enemy to attack so pretty much you can make the tiger pretty much invulnerable to most damage if he's placed in a good spot um, and he'll be able to move around the board very easily and uh, um, not uh, actually uh, incite any reaction attacks um well, actually, you know, I wonder if, if he can incite reaction attacks or if it's just that uh, he uh, he just can't make them. Because uh, it doesn't specifically say anything about that, but he does have eight movement, so it's pretty easy for him not to have to do that. <laughs> uh, I don't think so, because he doesn't count as a hero. Yeah, I would think, think not, especially because it has a thing foes can only target the tiger if there's no other possible enemy to attack um, but normally they wouldn't do that I don't know that's kind of a questionable one but I think normally we've played it that you can't actually attack them unless uh, there's nothing else so then the tiger cannot trigger events interact with portals which is a big one there altars chests levers so basically you can't have them run around and do things for you he's basically just to go around and do a little extra damage to maybe backline heroes or or uh, other enemies, kind of team up on them. Uh, and, but he does take damage from lava and spikes, so you got to still obey the same type of uh, movement that you would do with a hero and try not to step, cross cut, you know, lava squares or spike squares. All right, so anyway, um, that is summon tiger, so it's a pretty cool thing to get an extra little companion here and uh, I'll, I'll jump into a story about this character once I finish uh, this so mystical strike going back here uh, our benefit before striking you may declare a plus two bonus to your roll if you do the tiger takes three damage so you can do more damage at the uh, life of your tiger you know, so you can do up to 12 damage uh, or the base 10. The effect is you may swap places with the tiger, which is a good way to basically t teleport into the back lines almost because you're getting eight movements, so you can move quite a bit. And then you or an ally within five squares, you regains four hit points. So then you get a, a pretty good heal. I mean, four hit points is pretty dang good, especially when you're comparing like Holy Sword, right? And Sir Eric, he's only getting three, and that's a tank move. <laughs> um, we were just talking about uh, Askren, right? Recently, he can dump up to ten, uh, but even Wings of Justice only does three. So, 
that's a very uh, very strong ability as well. Uh, the you know between the movement and then getting heal and potentially doing more damage. So it's a mystical strike is a very strong ability. Um, and then we talk about Summon Tiger. Now we're going to Waves of Justice. So range 8, up to 3 combatants except you. Uh, so you're going to do 0 damage on your each hit that you do. And the effect is all targets hit take 12 damage if it's an enemy uh, or regain 12 hit points if it's an ally. So basically, you get to choose any uh, 3 people except for yourself and either do some healing or do some damage. So this is uh, pretty strong. Um, you know, we're talking about up to, what, 36 damage if you're focusing on that or or healing or some, some combination of each. So overall, this character is extremely strong character. Uh, I believe it was kind of designed this a little bit on purpose. Um, because you'll notice that if you look in the campaign rules, you actually cannot play the Faceless Emperor as part of your uh, your team. That's uh, what it officially says in the story. You're not supposed to play him. You know, could you? Sure, you always could if you really wanted to, but that's not what the rules say. Uh, but anyway, he, he is an extremely strong hero. Still requires a lot of knowledge to be able to play him extremely effectively, which... Honestly, I, I don't think I even have enough um, play time, at least with this character, to play him really effectively either. Um, I think I've only played him like, I don't know, maybe two times? So, just the specials in general don't see quite as much play because I don't... Sometimes I don't feel like they're quite at the same balance level as some of the other cl classes are. Um, I mean, you can just look at this character and think, like, dang, like, these are extremely strong abilities. Like, how the heck did this guy get through? Well, how he got through is he, uh, so they were going to add this character in the Kickstarter. And at the time, they hadn't even designed, like, how his character was going to work. All they knew was that they wanted to make this, uh, the Emperor character, and I think... I'm not sure if that for sure if they were going to actually include the tiger or not, but the interesting thing that happened was one of the uh, so there was a lot of discussion going on in the first Kickstarter comments, and some people were talking about the idea of well, there you know the emperor has this cool looking tiger on there. What if he could like actually use this tiger in battle, and they like supported each other, and you know there was interactions and stuff and. Um, and anyway, so Dragori actually took that and decided to design this character off of that. And even more interesting is they made this character, and this this character here is the one that actually inspired them to create the commander class. So you'll you know we'll probably see more once you know we know all the abilities of the other commanders. But basically, this is like the the first generation uh, unofficial commander. Uh, before uh, before Tenaris Adventures, so it's a little uh, fun fun factoid of uh, what was happening in the first campaign and how the kind of development of this character went. But anyway, what do you think about the Faceless Emperor? Uh, he's pretty broke. <laughs> mm. Um, he's out of the three so far special characters. He's my favorite. Uh, not only. Because he looks kind of cool. I mean, he's a faceless emperor, but he um, his abilities are awesome. Yeah. I mean, ways of justice. You know, you can heal up to thirty six, or like you said, some combination of hits or regaining. But if you hit all three, I mean, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. Either way. Definitely. So, um, when you summon a tiger, that thing can get pretty annoying. At it's like doing. It's like getting an extra attack every turn, almost like Jorana's um, yeah. ability. So. Well, and one thing that, I don't know, I forget if I mentioned this part, but to keep in mind too, is that the tiger uh, acts at the end of every um, turn of the Emperor's. So once the Emperor has finished doing what he does, then the tiger makes uh, his, his play. Right. So... 
So, I mean, it's, you know, the Tiger's only doing, right, six damage because he can only do basic attacks. But, uh, you know, every every little little bit counts. I mean, you could set set up the Tiger to do a little bit more if you, uh, um, you know, I mean, you can't empower him, but you could do, uh, uh, make a target vulnerable. Um, right. And he could uh, get the benefit of a... Uh, like that, for example, so you could turn that uh, into a nine. But it works well with mystical strike in certain positioning. Um, oh yeah, when you right. Swap with the tiger, so you could tag out. <laughs> oh, so good. So. Yeah, you could uh, basically, you know, get get that tiger into uh, a spot. Like let, let's say you're uh, you're take, taking some damage. And you need to kind of get out. You can move that tiger way out uh, from the battlefield, um, and uh, and then well, obviously you'd have to set it up for this for the next turn because your effect's going to happen before. But you'd have to set up the tiger further away and then uh, swap positions. And then, like I said earlier, you could also position him into good places to maybe get on top of some healers or shooters uh, or controllers in the back. And uh, get some work done there, too. But anyway, yeah. Good character, in my opinion. He's oh, a little yeah. broken, but... Definitely broken. I mean, I think he's he's a little too strong. But he's kind of a special, and just generally the specials, um, you know, don't really behave the in the same manner. And like I said, is not I don't think had the same level of balance that uh, balance and tuning that the others did. All right, so let me quickly mention that uh, you'll look here at the miniatures that are uh, included for uh, these characters. So one thing to note is Huron and the uh, Emperor are not getting reworks. So it was decided that they thought the Emperor and the Shapeshifters uh, details were sufficient enough that uh, they didn't require a rework. So that uh, will be still getting the original model on those guys, including the Tiger will still have the uh, the original model. You know, and, you know, obviously the model doesn't look as good as, you know, these, uh, these print sculpts that we see on here. But uh, they're not, they're not too bad, but... You know, I feel like there could have been some argument made that, that these guys could have deserved a, uh, a reworked as well. But I think the idea was that they thought, you know, these guys were kind of just, you know, they were like add-ons, right? It was kind of, you know, well, the shapeshifter was part of like the bonus basically for, I think, joining their Kickstarter like in the first couple days. Like the same way that they did with uh, Liz, hmm. right? The Medusa character. That's what the shapeshifter was. Um, and then if you miss that, then you could add them on uh, in the same way. And then the emperor was a stretch goal. So I think with these characters, they weren't as concerned about them because they were more just kind of thrown in a little bit more than they were the other ones that were specifically like designed into the game. So I don't know. Uh, sometimes I'm a little conflicted on... Uh, their their models and if they should have been improved all right so now let is go go to talessa the brand new character from uh dragon collection so obviously uh pretty much nobody has played this uh you know in in uh in actual real life yet um we've played her a couple times here on uh, our uh, uh, channel here uh, you'll see it's got an awesome model here that's pretty pretty epic with the you know sword and giant wings and everything but uh nobody's officially played her yet so we'll kind of have to wait to see exactly how everything plays down but so far, I'll try, we'll try to give a little bit of our impressions on what we think about her, but uh, just keep in mind, you know, there's still going to be a lot more to learn and play with this character before uh, we really have worked out exactly uh, all the, the pros and cons of this character. 
All right, so the Dragon Queen has uh, 65 hit points. A little bit up there. She's got a lower uh, basic attack, and there's a little bit of a reason for that, which you'll see later. She's got seven defense, six movements. She's got good, uh, good movement there and decent defense. And her uh, passive is Aura of the Queen. Trigger is just the start of her turn. She gets to choose a harmful condition, and then while adjacent uh, to her and all the enemies, uh, any of those enemies will have uh, that condition that she chooses. So you get to choose any condition. So this is kind of a little similar to like Chain Shape, where you get to apply like a harmful effect, except this one's like an AoE basically. Um, so anybody that's adjacent to the queen will, uh, you could say, you know, become cursed or exposed, slowed, vulnerable, or weakened. So it's actually uh, pretty strong, but there is a little bit of synergy with uh, one of her primaries. All right, so let's start with uh, Wings of Flames. Uh, r range one, one enemy, one enemy, nine damage, and the effect is you may move the target up to two squares. Then you may move uh, to any square adjacent to it. So if you guys remember our tank video that we did a while ago, Rurik has a very pretty similar ability. Crushing blow, range one, one enemy, 11 damage. The target is slowed. And then you may move the target up to two squares. And then you may move yourself up to two squares towards it. So this is kind of a little bit of a trade, but very similar move. Uh, so you're you're getting a little less damage you don't get the slowed which is actually um, now honestly that's really one of probably the best part of that ability because uh, it synergizes really well with the movement but anyway this, this is this is still pretty decent too so you get to move that characters two squares but instead of just moving two spots you get to move any square adjacent so you know, you got uh, Talisa here, right? And let's say she pushes uh, Knackle back too. Well, she doesn't just have to go here. She could go all the way on the other side. Maybe that, you know, puts her into a better spot. Or maybe, you know, you have another ally that's already standing, you know, over here. And now you've uh, made the character uh, mobs. I mean, you could also stand here and do that as well. But... You know, you could put yourself into basically any position with that, which is really the biggest benefit uh, of Wings of Flame. So, pretty good ability. Um, definitely being able to get that optimum movement is uh, really good, and moving that character as two spots is really strong. Uh, but not necessarily uh, uh, any, you know, crazy game-breaking uh, type of effect. Um and I guess the other thing, too, is uh, because the way that this is worded, the sound of it is um, that you wouldn't actually trigger reaction attack. And I don't know if that's a part that we fully have considered uh, in the past, but I, I'm pretty sure that's, that's the intent of this is that if you're moving this character two squares, if you, you know, you're going up to this, that you basically get to place your character anywhere. So it's not like they're moving here and then they're moving here and here and here and here or something like that. And they're inciting a reaction attack from, from Nacral. Um, I think you just kind of get to place them and you don't have to worry about any reaction attack on that one. Right. Um... <clears throat> In fact, let's see if the card says anything about that. I don't think so. Yeah, it doesn't say. All right. And then we got Dragon Gift. Uh, one square, one enemy. Gain the opposite condition of your aura. Applies once per turn, but your aura has no effect. So uh, this is kind of what I was saying with that synergy aspect. So basically, you're converting your area effect into a beneficial uh, aura or a, a beneficial effect for yourself. Um, so gain the opposite condition of your aura, but your aura has no effect. So yeah, you don't you don't get the area. F Oops, you don't get the area effect. But let's say you you decided to choose um, you know all the enemies that were next to you uh, are cursed. Um, I mean, actually, probably a pretty good one would be uh, 
uh, slowed because then people can't sidestep away from you. Um, but anyway, if you if you picked uh, that and then you'd become hastened, uh, and so then you don't incite any reaction attacks, um, which is a pretty good combination there. I mean, so you're gonna do uh, 11 damage on your hit, and your effect is regain three hit points. Uh, plus one hit point for each harmful condition applied on you. So this is the one that I feel like I don't fully understand exactly where they were going with this one. Um, so far, so far when we've played this character, we've kind of got the feeling that she's kind of like a uh, damagey, supporty, tanky type character. But, you know, getting that one extra hit point for each harmful condition applied, you know, most of the time you're only getting like one, maybe two harmful conditions on you at any point in time. So it's not really anything super helpful. And, and even still, most of the time, I don't think I even have any harmful conditions. So the three health points is probably like the normal that you're going to get. Um like comparing with like the emperor who got that four uh that's way better than hers where she has to have a special situation for it but you know getting uh basically you you know you plan this out you can pick, pick whatever uh whatever condition you want and apply it to almost whoever you want right i mean you can between positioning and choosing which ability uh you get to choose any of the conditions so can be really good if played uh played well but uh, not a super mind-blowing type of uh, uh, effect or ability either all right so really I in my opinion this is uh, her strongest ability it's royal breath range 8 one enemy the damage is 18 damage which is uh, a little bit lower on the special uh, side so I actually helped try to balance this character a little bit, and I think that is one of the suggestions I made, is I think they had Royal Breath. I think it was at like 20 or 22, 21, 22 or something originally, and I told them that this one specifically needed to probably take a little bit of a damage hit, and the main reason is the, this effect. So all enemies in a straight line from you to the target and all enemies adjacent to the target take eight damage each so and one thing you'll notice too is that this is like this is an effect this isn't separate attacks so you don't even need to roll for these um, that's what makes this incredibly strong um, because you'll, you'll even see like the miss, right? It doesn't say miss all. It just says the target takes 15 residual damage. So anybody that's standing in that line uh, will take damage. And then anybody that's adjacent to that character is going to take 8 damage. And 8 damage, I mean, maybe not sound like too much. But this adds up extremely quickly. I mean, if you position it well, you could hit probably you know three people relatively pretty easily um, you know you get somebody in line to your target and then just have one other person next to them you've hit three people so in my opinion that uh, three extra three uh, people or three total people that you're hitting with that you're gonna be doing up to uh, what 24 plus uh, 18 uh, what's that? Uh, the 42? Is that right, Code? Pull out the calculator. <laughs> um, anyway. Yeah, 42. Yeah, 42 damage. Relatively pretty easy to set up. Um, I mean, you know, you got six movements, so you got quite a bit. So you got to get, you know, the line is probably the hardest part. And then you get one, at least one other person that's standing next to that guy. Uh, and you're going to be doing 42 damage. I mean, that's, that's freaking crazy. That's a ton of damage. And, you know, you could do more if more people are clustered together. 
So this is extremely strong ability that you got to be very cautious of. Uh, when we were playing in our Winter Bash stream, this is one that I specifically told our team, hey, make sure you guys are spread out uh, because we don't want to get hit with uh, Royal Breath because this one can do massive damage if uh, people are placed uh, in bad spots. So anyway uh and then this is uh i mean I, I feel like i could have mentioned it for the other characters but i feel like they they're almost kind of self-explanatory in some way so bloody tail is i'd say maybe like this almost the signature move i mean royal breath is really good too but bloody tail almost the signature move of uh the dragon queen so it is range one one enemy 22 damage so pretty strong and then you get a permanent effect your reaction attacks reach is increased to two squares but you can never improve its damage uh, and foes villains and bosses take minus two damage uh, so basically what that means is you know all characters right they got their normal reaction range of one square well now the dragon queen she's got two squares so she's got a huge range that basically any melee character, um, unless you're unless you're doing a uh, uh, a range two ability on Talessa, you're gonna have to uh, incite a reaction attack just to be able to uh, get in range to attack her with Bloody Tail. So that's uh, pretty strong, um, and that is actually the reason why her basic attack is a 6. Uh, because if she had like an 8, I mean, that would be an extremely strong ability. And you'll notice that there's all that extra wording, right, about, you know, oh, well, you can't improve the, the, its damage. And, you know, foes and villains, or villains and bosses take minus 2 damage. Well... This this was the problem with this ability was it was too strong for PVE um, because the way that the AI in the game works is most of the time they're attacking characters that are closest to them, closest with the, uh, the lowest uh, hit points. So pretty much every time... Uh, they'd play around, they'd have enemies come in, and all of them uh, would incite reaction attacks. Uh, and so, um, you know, it was just, just way too strong. So that's why they decided to put a minus two damage on that. So basically, you're only going to get four damage for, for each hit that hits. Anyway, so Bloody Tail, uh, extremely strong uh, permanent effect there. Uh, not... I mean, it's still very good for PvP too, but uh, extremely strong for PvE. Uh, anyway, so that is the Dragon Queen. Uh, anything you want to talk about with uh, Talessa? She... She's really good. If you can pull off Royal Breath, where you're doing a lot of damage, like the 42. Mm -hmm. um, She's one I have to play more with. Um, oh, for sure. That, that's why I, I, you know, I preface this whole section with, I don't feel like we really have the full story yet because we haven't got enough testing ourselves to really give a good verdict on her yet. Right. It. It's. She. she she's fun to play. When I played her the first time when we first got her, I mean, she changed a little bit since then, but nothing astronomically changed yeah i mean um, ma mainly the i think the damage values kind of moved around a little bit a little bit and i think dragon gift uh got got moved around a little bit and the wings of flames effect like that the, the amount of movement that you got moved around a little bit uh really the biggest change i think was bloody tail because they just didn't know what to do for pve right but she's a fun character in my opinion Definitely a character to play once you get your dragon collection. Oh yeah, um, for sure. Out of, even though I said the faceless emperor emperor is probably the best, she was probably the most fun out of the three so far. Yeah. Um. But like I said, it's going to take a little bit more testing to make her as effective as possible. 
Yeah, definitely, and, you know, have to try, and, and she, as well as another character that you're not actually supposed to play, at least in the Tenaris campaign, and I don't know about the core campaign or not, do you remember if they said, was she blocked like the Emperor was? I believe, she, I know she's blocked in Tenaris, um, she but... Might, she might be blocked in, uh, in, I, um in core box as well but i'm not sure about that i don't know about core box nor do i see why she would the only reason why tenaris is because she's part of the story i believe so yeah where she comes up somewhere as maybe side quest or something well but... yeah i mean that's kind of the reason with the faceless emperor too right he's part of the story and Intent. you may, you may <laughs> or may not run into him at certain parts of the game but, um, yeah, I mean, you, you could still definitely play her if you want. Definitely be a fun one. And, you know, with the ideas that we had talked about is because she has that harmful aura that she can put around is she could potentially be kind of, you know, like a kind of tanky. I mean, you know, you could go around and make uh, everybody exposed uh, around them and make everybody an easy target, you know, really set up. For example, like an AOE character, um, Averlum, right? Arcane Blast, he's got a role for each person that's in a 3x3 three three area. Um, you know, max, unless you want to hit the Dragon Queen, Dragon Queen from uh, Friendly Fire, you know, you're basically only looking at three heroes you could hit at one time with that. But, um, you know, basically make everyone exposed and increase his chances of hitting. I think slowed is actually a really good one to do. Slow. Um, because, you know, make it so nobody can sidestep. You get uh, that aura on top of, you know, healers and, uh, uh, or shooters or, or controllers and make everybody slowed. They're all going to have to incite reaction attacks just to, uh, you know, not, not basically, uh, be hit by the dragon queen so there they'll be they'll be in a lot of trouble uh with this if play placed appropriately there's just there's so many possibilities with this i mean the aura is extremely strong um but remember it's only while adjacent to you enemies have this condition so if enemies move away they don't know they no longer have this and if you move away, then they no longer have this. So it's it has to be wherever she is placed at. So once she ends her turn somewhere, that's the, anybody that's near her will have that. Anyway, so that's uh, Tell Us of the Dragon Queen. Uh, like I said, maybe not the full story yet on her. Uh, probably be more to say after we've uh, gotten to play with her some more and seen some other scenarios and combinations with her. But great seems like a, a pretty awesome character and can, can be potentially very strong um, all these characters are you really need to understand the the mechanics of the game and the conditions to use effectively so if you are starting this game you know you just got you got your wave one box in and you're all excited to play maybe maybe wait I mean I'm not saying you, you can't but you may want to wait to play uh, the Shapeshifter, the Faceless Emperor, and Talessa because uh, you may be a little over your head until you kind of learn more of the basics of the game, understand the advanced rules, learn some of the, the intricacies of some of the other characters and their abilities uh, before you jump into these guys because they're kind of our, uh, a special, definitely very special, right? <laughs> <laughs> Um, anyway, in terms of synergies, uh, all these characters are extremely versatile, uh, and I kind of get the feeling that is probably their main theme. If, if there is something that ties all these characters together, it's their versatility. Um, you got Huron, who basically is using almost anybody's ability in the game. <laughs> <laughs> you got the Faceless Emperor, who can do pretty crazy things i mean he's attacking people close far he's got tigers that's teleporting him around i mean he's 
he's kind of got the whole gambit of uh, doing damage, and, and he's even got some healing. I mean, not anything... Actually, no, yeah, he, I mean, he's definitely got the full gambit, right? I mean, he's even got some decent healing he can do as well, if needed. And then you got Talessa, who's got all of her damaging uh, uh, effects that she can be putting in an area around her, or Royal Breath that can do massive damage if placed right, uh, and even some movement, so... Yeah, there's there's a lot lot to go on with these guys. A lot of possibilities, versi versatile uh, teams that you can make with them. You just gotta gotta know how to place them right. It's key. So anyway, if they're, I mean, I don't know. I feel like there's another one of these cases where I can't really give specific cases. Um, part of that reason, too, is not even just that these characters are so versatile and they could basically be played with like any other class. It is just the fact that I personally haven't gotten quite as much time as, as maybe I should have with uh, some of the other classes. I've played all these other classes quite extensively. But not the special classes as much, and like I said, as partially that's because they don't feel quite like they've they've received that full balance and fine tuning that the original classes got. But anyway, that is pretty much it for today. Um, I think we are kind of so this is the last spotlight special, so we're all finished with this series. Um, I uh, probably still working on some some other things for next year. See what uh, new things we have for the channel. We'll definitely have some more PVE or PVP content. I was uh, talking to somebody potentially about doing a, a campaign again, trying to get the campaign going. I know we did that one forever ago, and it kind of just sort of fell apart, which is a little disappointing. Um, you got to really have people that can kind of consistently come to it. And of course, you know, there's a lot of tracking and everything that isn't quite the same level in uh, tabletop simulator as it is in real life. Cause you have like an actual sheet that you can write all your information and stuff down versus tabletop simulator it doesn't really have that. So, um, anyway, so there's a, there's some challenges with that, but, uh, so we might be doing that and then um, hopefully playing some boss versus boss in the next month or two. And before we know it, uh, all the uh, Wave 1 content should be showing up. Uh, they're still currently looking at uh, January, February for shipping, which most likely means you won't receive your content until I bet you absolutely earliest anyone would receive something is probably March. And then probably April and May is probably more likely, I'm um, thinking right now, for people re receiving their content. Um, keep in mind that uh, even though, you know, they've been saying, oh, well, Wave 2 is shipping in July. Well, yeah, it's shipping, but it probably won't be received until like October, November. So, uh, so we still still got a little bit of a ways till we uh, got some new stuff, and we will be starting a D and D group uh, in what? What are we doing? It Wednesday? Yeah, Wednesday. We're doing right? Wednesdays, yes. Yeah. So in preparation for the uh, Tenaris RPG that's coming out. We're kind of getting some practice here. Me and Code are uh, joining a D and D group led by Joe, who's uh, in our Discord, and we'll, so we'll just be doing some some classic D and D stuff, just to kind of learn the basics and play around. So I may show some video on that. And uh, anyway, so that's kind of what we have coming up. And I uh, hope everyone has a good year. And we will see you next year. All right. See you later, Code. Peace.